Good afternoon. It, this gives me so much joy to see this kind of a turnout for uh, one of our lectures. This is the first face-to-face -face lecture that we've had uh, school-wide since 2020, the spring of 2020, so almost two years now. And uh, it really just does my heart good to see particularly so many students come out for an event like this. And hopefully you got copies of the book. Uh, the book author, of course, Pam Fessler, is here to talk to you today about the, uh, the book and her experiences, and uh, uh, we're just glad you're here. I'm Tom Chandler, by the way. I'm your dean. Um, I've seen many of you around. You probably didn't know who, who's the guy in the tie, but that's me. I'm your dean. And um, we're really pleased especially to have with us today our keynote speaker, Pam Fessler, and Pam will be sharing with you some of the many lessons from her wonderful book, Carville's Cure, which many of you, hopefully all of you, have had a chance to uh, at least read some of it if you haven't had time to read all of it. Um, the book offers really a, a very compelling account of the history of the federal leprosarium that operated in South Louisiana throughout much of the 20th century, and especially about the many human lives that it challenged that it touched, it treated, and it even healed. But before I offer a formal introduction of Pam, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and welcome her husband, Mr. Matt Cole. Matt, would you stand up and let folks see you? You may recall in the book, Matt's grandfather, Morris Cole, was the inspiration for Pam's book. And as an enlisted soldier in the U.S. Army, Morris was sent to the Philippines back in 1902. And there he contracted leprosy, which is, of course, now more properly called Hansen's disease, uh, which was endemic in the Philippines, I think is still endemic in the Philippines, uh, when he encountered quite unsanitary conditions as a, uh, a soldier uh, fighting in that, that part of the world. His eventual diagnosis years later led to his confinement at the National Leprosarium, which came to be called Carville, which is named after the small Louisiana town on the Mississippi River where it's located. And some of you may have seen uh, or encountered uh, James Carville, a frequent commentator on NPR. He was Bill Clinton's chief political advisor back in the 90s before most of you were born. But uh, his family is the, um, uh, the, the town of Carville is, is named uh, uh, after his relatives. And it's a small town on the Mississippi River just south of Baton Rouge. Now, Morris Cole's story, which was kept as a family secret for over 60 years, is what drew and inspired Pam to research the history of the Leprosarium and to publish her outstanding book. And if you notice in the book, the book is extremely well referenced. Her research was impeccable uh, in producing this, this book. And she's going to be around. You can talk to her about that at the end of her, her talk today. And Pam would like for this to be a very much a question and answer, give and take. So there's your opportunity to talk to an outstanding American author about what it's like to write a book uh, like Carville's Cure. So now I'd like to formally introduce Pam. Pam earned her bachelor's degree in American studies from Douglas College up at Rutgers University in New Jersey, followed by a master's degree in public administration from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Early in her career, Pam was a writer for Congressional Quarterly Magazine, where she worked for 13 years, both as a reporter and as an editor. She then became, be, began what would become a very distinguished career at National Public Radio, or NPR, where she was an editor and a very well-known correspondent for more than 28 years. As a correspondent on the NPR National Desk, Pam covered a breadth of issues that included things like voting rights, poverty, philanthropy, homelessness, homelessness hunger, affordable housing, and income inequality, all of which, of course, you as public students know, carry with it or with them pressing public health concerns. Pan's research on the history of Carville's difficult development into the world's leading treatment and research center for Hansen's disease 
and the accompanying pervasive challenges of containing and treating leprosy in the 20th century resonates profoundly today, particularly as we continue to navigate all the anxiety, the stigma, and the divisions that have been created by diseases like COVID-19, like the AIDS, HIV epidemic, and even Ebola in Africa. So it's for all these reasons that I'm especially grateful and proud to have Pam join the Arnold School and the Arnold School family of students and faculty today and give us a talk about your book. So Pam, without further ado, if you come up. Thank you. And please, everyone, wear your mask during the presentation. We're kind of tightly packed in here, so if you would, thank you. I'm going to make sure I get this on here. <laughs> and there we go. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah good, good, good. good. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This is, I'm kind of blown away by the size of this audience. I'm so glad that you all showed up, and I hope you have lots of good questions to ask me. Um, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it and, and the story of Carville. And, you know, as the dean talked about, you know, I was covering when I worked at NPR, I covered poverty, I covered all these other issues. I never covered anything related to health or medicine or science. I had no idea about any of those fields. Um, so you might ask, well, why did I end up writing a book about leprosy and the US um, leprosarium? And it was a personal story. And it started out with this man here, who is my father-in-law, Harold Cole. And in this picture, he is a, a young boy, obviously a teenager. That's his father to the right. Um, when he was an elderly man, when he was 78 years old, he called up, he called us up out of the blue one day, my husband and I, and he said, I have something to tell you. I've been keeping something a secret for more than 60 years, and I feel like it's time that I need to share it with you. And he told us that not, not long after this photo was taken, he went to school one day, and he came home, and his father was gone. His father, to the right, was gone. And he never saw him again, and he wasn't actually quite sure where he had been taken. And um, he knew that his father had leprosy. Um, but his mother said, don't ever tell anybody that your father had leprosy because the stigma was so great, this was in the 1930s, that it will destroy the family. It will shame the family. It will destroy the family business, which was a, a meat market. And um, so, so my father-in-law, as I say, never saw his father again. And he was told that um, he needed to not tell anybody about this. And it turns out that while he was at school that day, the public, public health officials had come and taken his father away to a hospital down south. And when he told us this story, we were like, you know, this is amazing. This was in 1998 they told us this story. So we went and started investigating to try and find out where his father had been taken. And that's when we discovered that the federal government, the US federal government, ran a hospital for leprosy patients, people in the United States who were diagnosed with leprosy during the 20th century, hundreds, if not thousands of them, were confined at this hospital in Louisiana called Carville. And let me just show you. So we actually decided to take my father-in-law down there and to see it, because it still existed in 1998. And we came and we realized <laughs> this is what it this picture is an older picture, it's the 1950s, but it, it doesn't look that much different today. So there was this huge facility. And when I got there, I realized that not only was my father-in-law's family affected by this disease and torn apart because of this disease, but it turns out there were hundreds, thousands of families in this country that were ripped apart because somebody in the family was sick with leprosy. And then the other thing I discovered was that leprosy is probably one of the least contagious diseases there is. That 95% of the human race cannot even contract 
leprosy. Only another five, only about 5% can, and they only can get it with long-term sustained contact with either somebody who um, already has the disease or the, there, there are other ways that they possibly can get it. Um, but because the stigma of leprosy was so great and ignorance about the disease, these people were confined at this facility down in, in Carmel, many of them for the rest of their lives. My husband's grandfather ended up dying there. Um, and there was no cure in the early 1900s. Um, so when people went there, it was basically a life sentence. And there was a barbed wire top fence around there. You could not leave. You not only lost your um, freedom, you lost your family. You were taken away from your family. You were um, encouraged, patients were encouraged to change their names. So many of them lost their identities. They were encouraged to change their names so that their families would not uh, be uh, marked with the embarrassment of somebody with leprosy. Um, they also lost their voting rights until 1946. Patients who were at Carville could not vote. Um, women who had babies at Carville had them taken away from them um, and put up for adoption um, or, or placed with a family member. So it, it, it was, when, when I went down there and saw this, I, I honestly was astounded that the US government, this was run by the US government, um, would do such a thing, and part of it was related to, we just had a lot of um, ignorance and misperceptions about the disease and how dangerous it was. Um, but the other thing I discovered about Carville, when I, it, it, so all these patients were there. Uh, over the course of the, of the hospital, there were about 5,000 patients. But at any one time, there might have been three or 400 patients. And they were an extraordinary cross-section of American life. And they created their own community in there, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, but it, it was an extraordinary place. So in some ways, it was a prison, but it was also a haven for a lot of these patients because the world outside was not very nice to people who were diagnosed with leprosy. They were scorned. Um, as a lot of you probably know, you know from the Bible, there are stories about um, you know, of people who, who are presumed, were presumed at the time to have had leprosy. We, we now think it was not that disease. Um, and they, that was seen as a depiction of sin or a sign of sin. And so they were sent away from the community um, as outcasts. And as we know, the word leper means outcast today in our common language. Um, let me just say, so I just want to go a little bit about the history back, how it got started, and then we can maybe talk a little bit about more questions, some, some of the questions. So it got started in the 18, late 1800s, and it was started as something called the Louisiana Leper Home. And um, the state of Louisiana actually had probably more <coughs> leprosy cases than a lot of other parts of the country. And around the turn of the century, there was a lot of hysteria, not hysteria, but there was a lot of concern, growing concern about germs, and, and this recognition that germs could in fact cause diseases. And people started getting worried about immigrants, especially, bringing in diseases. Um, and so that all came to play where people, people had had leprosy in Louisiana for decades, and people really weren't all that concerned about it. But around the turn of the century, there became a real big anti-immigrant, um, uh, especially against Chinese immigrants that they were bringing in dangerous diseases and we need to do something about it. And diseases could be spread by these things called germs. So as a former reporter, I'm embarrassed to say that one of the main um, proponents of this idea that patients need, that people with leprosy needed to be sent away were the, was the, uh, the newspapers in Louisiana, which helped create this public hysteria that we need to do something about uh, these patients. And so there was a big movement to try and create a hospital for leprosy patients in New Orleans. 
Well, when the state tried to set up that hospital, nobody wanted it anywhere in their neighborhood. They said, we don't want any leprosy patients near us because it's gonna lower our land values, it's gonna spread the disease, even though none of that was true. Um, so they couldn't find any place, any place to care for these leprosy patients, except they finally found a plantation, an old abandoned plantation, about 70 miles from Louisiana, from New Orleans, that, they, they, that the state could rent. They actually told the people in the neighborhood they were gonna turn it into an ostrich farm because they didn't want anybody uh, to get, uh, to, to stop them. They brought the patients up in the middle of the night and when they got there, this is what it looked like. So the patients, obviously couldn't live in the mansion, so they ended up putting them up in the slave quarters in the back behind the mansion. And basically, they left the patients there. They deserted them. And eventually, um, so the patients actually were worse off under, the, under this new, lepr uh, the new uh, um, Louisiana leper home. Okay, oops, let me go back to this. So they finally were able to recruit Daughters of Charity who are based in New Orleans to come out and take care of the patients. And they became the nurses. They couldn't get anybody else to come care. That, that's just how um, leprosy was seen at the time. It's just something so repulsive and um, um, you know, it's something to be avoided at all costs. And remember, this is hardly a contagious, it's not a very contagious disease at all. Um, but it was all because of the stigma. So the nurses, so the sisters took care of them. You know, it was really rough, um, but about the same time, so this was in, um, actually, 1896, and um, eventually, at the same time, there was started getting concern around the country, around the United States, not just in Louisiana, about different leprosy uh, cases, and that the federal government should start, should create a national leprosarium. Um, to, to, to do some, because nobody wanted these people. I mean, they really were, were treated like dirt, quite frankly, and everybody just wanted to get rid of them. Um, and so there was a real demand to, for the federal government to create a national leprosarium. And I will just show one quick picture. I have way more pictures than I should be probably showing. Uh, this man is a guy named John Early, so if anybody has been reading the book, he's like one of the main reasons that we had a national leprosarium because he came to Washington, D.C. A doctor diagnosed him with leprosy. They had, this was in 1908. They had no idea what to do with him. They shoved him out. They brought him to a tent along the Potomac where he stayed for months and months and months until it got too cold. Um, and they let him live in a house with his wife and kids, but they built a brick wall down the middle of the house. So he had to stay on one side and they had to stay on the other and they were never allowed to uh, see each other or touch each other. So I mean, it was just, it was just bizarre, but, but nobody knew what to do with leprosy patients and there was such a public demand to, to, for the government to do something. So eventually Congress passed a law that created a national leprosarium they tried to find a place to build it. They couldn't, nobody wanted it, no state wanted it. Eventually, they decided to buy the Louisiana leper home from, um, well, the state of Louisiana, and that became what we now know as Cargill. They started bringing patients in from all over the country. Um, the sisters were still there. They couldn't get other people to, other nurses, even though it was run by the federal government, they couldn't get other nurses to come and take care of the patients. So the federal government actually hired the sisters to continue being the nurses. And actually they stayed there till uh, 2005, that's how long. Um, the patients, they brought patients from all, there were old patients, there were um, rich patients, there were poor patients, people who got leprosy, and there were children. There were children who were brought, who were diagnosed with leprosy. They were taken away from their families and they were brought to Cargill. Um, but, okay, what I, was, what I was gonna say is what happened is then this community started. There was no cure for the disease. So basically these people realized that when they were uh, sent to Cargill, they could spend the rest of their lives there. But, as I say, they started building this community. And they started um, having plays, they started having music groups, 
Um, the federal government actually encouraged this because they realized if they didn't, people would run away, if they didn't let people have kind of a normal life. Because um, it was Louisiana. They had Mardi Gras uh, every year. So big, that was the big deal. They had um, floats, they had Mardi Gras parade. They were trying to let it, people real, um, sort of live as normal life as possible. But inside, behind barbed wire fences, away from their families. Um, they had a baseball team. Um, they had, you know, they had clubs, they had bars. And one thing I want you to see about this, this is, we're talking about Louisiana, rural Louisiana in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, in the Jim Crow South. Inside Carnival was incredibly integrated. In place, so this is a bar at Carville, inside the facility, and you can see there are black um, customers, uh, the patients, there are white patients, there are Hispanic patients, there are Asian patients. And this was an extraordinary community, right? So they brought together these patients, people who would not uh, probably be hanging out together outside of Carville. The classrooms were integrated. The sports team, the baseball team was integrated. And my feeling was that, that, that these patients basically shared or were bound together by the discrimination they faced on the outside because of their disease. And that got them to be very, become activists, right? So they're, in, they're stuck here, right? They've been abandoned by everybody, but they've got a fairly good, you know, they're being taken care of by the government. They don't have a cure for the disease yet. Um, they start becoming activists. They start questioning, because they all knew that they could tell that leprosy was not that contagious, because nobody who worked there ever contracted the disease. So they started questioning, why are we here? Why are we being basically imprisoned by our government? Um, let me just go. So simultaneously, when they start becoming active, there's more effort. There's a lab there, and there's a lot of research that's being done um, to try and find a cure for the disease. And the patients were pretty receptive to trying almost everything. I mean, they tried um, uh, heat, uh, x-ray therapy, um, any, any kind of solution um, or medicine that anybody thought might have a chance of curing this disease because they wanted to get out. Because they realized without that, they were stuck there for the rest of their lives. So what happened is um, that one of the chief medical officers, um, his name was Guy Faget, in 1941 came to Carville and he was an expert in tuberculosis. And there's a lot of similarity between tuberculosis and Hansen's disease, which is actually the, the current name uh, for leprosy. And there was a drug that was being tested on TB patients uh, called Promin, and it was not working very well. But he thought, well, let's see if it works on leprosy patients. And so they decided to see if they could get volunteers at Carville to try this drug. And um, this is sister, Sister Hillary Ross, who took photos of patients. She was a, quite a photographer. She also was the chief pharmacist at Carville. And she chronicled people's progress. Well, lo and behold, the Proman started to work. And I just showed this one photo here. It didn't work immediately. It didn't work for everyone. It took time, but it was the first sign that anything, uh, that there was a potential medication and treatment for this. So this woman, who is a patient of Carville, this is 1940. She has a pretty advanced case of leprosy. Um, by the way, a lot of patients, you wouldn't need, you'd look at them, you know, like half of you could have leprosy and we wouldn't even know. Uh, this is a very advanced case. Um, this is her part. She started taking the Proman. This is in 43, 45, 1947. And they called this the Carville Miracle. So, now you have the patients, we've just come out of World War II. They have something that looks like it's a cure. 
The patients already think they're being confined unfairly, that they, they've been taken away from their families. Now they really get active. They start a newspaper, they start lobbying, they start lobbying Congress, they start, there's a, a man named Stanley Stein who's a patient there who becomes editor of the newspaper. The patients start writing articles in the newspaper saying, why are our rights being taken away? This is totally unfair. The American Legion, because there were quite a few um, uh, veterans there, they adopt Cargill kind of as a cause and they finance the newspaper. They start distributing it to their members around the country. Pretty soon, this a newspaper has a circulation of 80,000. And the federal government starts getting a lot of pressure. You need to shut this place down. Now, it took quite a while, but after about 20 years, the federal government did realize that there was no reason to keep these patients here, that they could be treated as outpatients. So they decided that it's time to get the patients out, to send them away, and shut down cargo. So guess what happens then? Some of these patients have been there, like that little boy on the tricycle, for decades. They have no family. They have no jobs. They, the only thing they know is living in Carville. And a lot of the patients said, we're not leaving. You took us away from our families and our communities. You now need to take care of us for the rest of our lives. And if we want to stay here, we should be allowed to stay here. If we want to leave, we should be able to leave. And after a lot of uh, protests, finally, the federal government agreed. OK, if you want to stay, you can stay. And some patients stayed. The last patient who left was in uh, 2015. Um, and a lot of them. You know, that they, they, they were older, and, you know, almost in some ways was like a nursing home. But this became their family. Um, and so when we went down there to visit in 1998, there were still patients there. And now, now there's no more patients there. 2015 was the last patient. Most of the people have actually died out or, or have left. You know, they were people who just decided to leave. But the federal government still treats people who have car um, Hansen's disease who are diagnosed. There's still 200 new cases a, a year in the United States. But around the world, there are 200,000 new cases a year, mostly in India, Brazil, Africa. And um, the stigma that we now have a cure, that, you know, people can be cured. Uh, we have a, a, a drug combination. They basically, if they get this drug, within 48, 72 hours, they will no longer be contagious. They can be have the um, germ completely um, eradicated from their body within maybe a year or so, uh, if the case is not too advanced. But people still don't seek treatment because they're afraid of the stigma. So while the disease has been cured, the stigma still remains. Um, and with that, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I, I think one of the interesting things would be about, you know, now that we're dealing with our own uh, epidemic, or pandemic, I guess. Well, I'll say good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. And I want to offer my thanks to Ms. Fessler for being with us and for bringing the images and the individuals from Carville to life for each of us. I'm Lee Pearson, I'm the associate, an associate dean in the Arnold School, and I had the privilege of moderating the questions for this afternoon. I have some of my own, but I also have a microphone, and I'm sure one of my colleagues would be willing to carry the microphone to you if you have a pressing question for, for Ms. Fessler today. This is a rare opportunity to talk to an author um, about a book that's so relevant to public health and to be able to hear her unpack uh, the information for us. My first question to you really comes from the prologue of your book, uh, where you mentioned that those who were diagnosed with Hansen's disease had an enemy, of course, of a physical illness, uh, but also a social one. Um, and I'm wondering if you would uh, describe for us the social ills that really you discovered in your research that were faced by those with, with Hansen's disease, 
not only the patients, but their, their families as well, as you referenced. Yeah, I mean, so, so if somebody was diagnosed, especially in the, the, the first part of the 20th, 20th century, if they were diagnosed with leprosy um, and somebody found out about it, they could be pushed out of their jobs, they could be, um, uh, somebody would, um, uh, you know, um, you know they, they might even, if they were kids and they were in schools, they'd be kicked out of school. There were these two boys in Newark, New Jersey, who were diagnosed in the uh, 1920s. When they were found out that they had the disease, not only were the boys taken out of school, they were sent to Carville. The school burned all of the school books in the school and the desks in the entire school because they were so worried that this germ um, you know, would, would, would spread. And um, people's houses were burned down. And it was mostly fear of the disease because people really didn't know, honestly. You know, there, there was a lot of ignorance about it. They, they read all these stories and they thought, you know, this is terrible. We could get this di disease. And as you can see, in, in many ways, it is physically, it can be physically frightening um, and repulsive to many people. So people didn't want to get that. And you also then had the religious connotations that people who were religious, a lot of them thought this was a reflection of, a, of somebody who had done something really bad. And this was a sign that God was punishing them. And so the stigma was really, was really terrible. And quite frankly, I think still exists today in many ways. Speaking of, of today, I'm curious as to what parallels you see between the response to Hansen's disease and our current response today to COVID-19. And I'm also interested in what lessons you think we still have yet to learn uh, from uh, the experiences a century ago to what we're experiencing today. Um, well, there's the, a couple of things. So one of the first things that struck me when COVID, um, I, I started this book before I knew there was ever going to be a pandemic. Um, and then it got published right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, was how, like the first, the first response was almost to demonize the victims, to demonize the patients, that somehow it was the patient's fault that they got sick. So you had that with leprosy. Some people had that initially, certainly uh, with AIDS, when AIDS was first um, uh, discovered, people blamed the victims. You know, they got AIDS because of their, you know, lifestyle choice. Um, and that had nothing to do with the public at large. I think there was a little bit of that with COVID initially. There was a lot of use of that disease to um, discriminate against certain groups of people, right? Um, Asian Americans. Already, you know, we've seen so many examples of them being somehow blamed for this disease, you know, and as though that were a way to respond, a productive way to respond to this disease. And the use of leprosy to condemn Chinese Americans who came to the United States around the late 1800s and the early 1900s was extraordinary. And mostly, it was by people in labor groups who were worried about these Chinese immigrants taking away their jobs. So they started saying, look, all these Chinese immigrants are bringing in leprosy. They're working in your laundries. They're going to touch your clothes. Um, you know, they're going to give, give you leprosy if you go to a Chinese laundry. Um, it, it was pretty extraordinary. And then, of course, I heard a lot of the echoes of that uh, when we first had, you know, the China virus or the Kung Fu. This, this trying to deal with a disease by characterizing it as some evil thing, you know, that, that somebody had, was responsible for. Um, I think the other thing is just, you know, when, when we have a lack of information and facts about a disease, it just opens the way for all this misinformation and all this, these prejudices to take hold. 
And so I think one of the lessons is how important it is for health officials to, to make sure that the public knows exactly what they do know and what they don't know um, when they, as soon as they do know it. Um, because otherwise you just get all this misinformation as we are obviously seeing today. I think uh, on that note, I want to skip to the last chapter of your book, which you entitled Lessons Not Learned. Um, and in that chapter, you state that all the medical knowledge in the world has failed to eliminate the biggest barriers to treating Hansen's disease. They're discrimination, superstition, and ignorance. Um, sadly, those barriers do remain today, as you just uh, referenced. Uh, what is your counsel to us as to how we best address those barriers? Oh, for, for Hansen's disease. Or for any of the health challenges that we face. Well, I would say for Hansen's disease, I mean, the one thing with Hansen's disease, we one, we know it can be easily cured, and two, we know it's not that contagious. Um, all these myths about leprosy that you know people's fingers fall off or skin falls off just aren't true. And um, so I think it, it, it behooves um, leaders, whether they're health leaders or political leaders, to continue to make that case, you know, to, to continue, continue to educate people that this is not a threat. We have actually seen just in the last few years how um, the threat of leprosy and other diseases has been used to criticize immigrants coming, caravans of immigrants coming to, at our southern border. There are people in this country who have said they're bringing in all these dangerous diseases, including leprosy. So it's still being used as kind of a political weapon, uh, this disease. Um, a lot of the people, some of the people who are very critical of homeless encampments and the growth of homeless encampments, which is a serious problem in Los Angeles, also accused those homeless um, people of spreading leprosy, which is just not true. And you know what? Even if they were, which they're not, we can cure it. Um, but. It's almost like, so, so it really just sort of takes leadership, I think, in a way, and, and the media too, I think, have, has a role in making sure that people understand this. Or just read my book. Yeah. <laughs> well, reading your book is certainly a good start for folks. Um, in that regard, you obviously did an amazing amount of research uh, for this book, and I'm curious about two things. One, what were the greatest resources to you in being able to create this story? Um, but also, what were some of the um, most interesting discoveries that you made along the way in doing the research? Um, so I, I had an abundance of information. So those sisters that you saw, the Daughters of Charity, they were meticulous note keepers. And they kept diaries of every, basically daily diaries, of what happened at Carville every day. I had access to their diaries. Their archives are in um, Emmitsburg, Maryland, near where I live. So I could go back and I could see all these things, how you know, Sister Benedicta was writing to the state saying, we don't have enough um, water. We, we don't, all, all the things, we've been abandoned here. We don't have any medicine. You know, These patients are dying. Wait, that's one thing I wanted to mention. This, this Carville is in a very deserted area of Louisiana, it was really deserted at the time when it was okay. It was also probably one of the worst places in the country to try and care for people with leprosy because it was swampy, it was mosquito infected, and most of the patients who did die in the early 1900s died of other diseases. They didn't die of uh, the Hansen's disease, they died of malaria, they died of TB, uh, they died of the flu. Um, it was a terrible place to put patients, but we had to get them as far away from society, the rest of society as possible. Um, so anyway, the nuns, I had the sisters, I had tons of information. The patients, that newspaper that I talked about, the star that the patients wrote, um, that newspaper came out twice a month for, for decades, and it actually still exists today, and the patients depicted 
their daily lives. There were just tons of articles about all their parties and baseball games, um, their opinion pieces about whether or not, um, you know, they sh how they should be treated, about the scientific discoveries. So that all exists. I had access to that. Several of the patients, Stanley Stein, um, a couple of others, that John Early, the guy in the tent, he ended up in Carville, but he wrote a memoir. Um, so I, I was able to get access to those, which were great. And then there were still patients alive when I started researching these books. A few you know, elderly patients, and I was able to interview most of them before there were 13 who were still in the care of the federal government. When I started research that in 2016, there's only one more left, but I was able to interview all those other people, um, you know, about, um, about what life was like at Carver. So I really had just tons and tons of, of information. Um, some people have asked me, did I run into any obstacles uh, doing it? And I, quite frankly, I didn't really, but I wonder, it makes me wonder how many families like ours have kind of a erased the history. What, what don't we know, right? How many families were in, in many ways destroyed or torn apart by this disease and never talked about it? And people changed their names. So we don't know. You know, we were fortunate that Matt's father decided to tell us before he died about this. We, I wouldn't know anything about this. And so I think there's probably, you know, many, 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 many similar stories. You opened your lecture by sharing a photo of your father-in-law and grandfather-in-law, and um, I'm wondering if you could share with us, did your father-in-law live to see this book being written, and um, what became of uh, Morris Cole, uh, the Carnival patient? Um, so no, Matt's father did not live to, um, to, to, to see the book. I did promise him before he died that I would write a book about Carnival. Um, I wasn't sure I really believed that I would at the time, <laughs> but I really, I felt so strongly about this story because I just, I really saw how this, well, my father-in-law was a lovely, lovely, lovely man. It's gonna make me cry. Um, but he was very um, shy and sort of reluctant to do things in life and reserved. And I think that a lot of that was because his father had been taken away when he was at such a young boy and because he had to keep this secret. And I have met other relatives of patients since I started doing the book, and they, they talk about the same thing, that their, their families were very secretive, there wasn't a lot of affection sometimes, because th this thing kind of hovered in the background. Nobody talked about it, but it was there. It was almost like they were, they were, they were tarred by this. Um, was he able to visit his father? That's no, well, no, no. And I think it, now his, no, he could have probably. Well, actually as a child, they didn't let children visit um, under a certain age. His wife, Matt's um, grandmother, we did find records that she did take a train. So they, they lived up in New York, by the way, and he was taken from there down to Carville. Um, and he, um, um, so she, we found records that she, in fact, did go visit him once. He only lived in Carl. He died within three years. And I want to just tell one other quick story, which is kind of interesting. So when the federal government created this place and said, okay, if you're diagnosed with leprosy, you have to go to this hospital because we don't want you. <laughs> well, the federal government actually did put it in the test. So we're trying to protect you and help you. Um, they left it up to state health officials to make the decision. And every state in the country said, okay, if we diagnose you with leprosy or Hansen's disease, you're going to Carville, except the state of New York. And the state of New York, the health officials there said, you know, this disease is just not that contagious. Why, why would we send people away? So if you were in New York and you were diagnosed, you weren't sent away. My father-in-law's father lived in Connecticut, and when he was diagnosed, that, that doctor said, I have to report you and send you to Carville, and you're gonna be taken away from your family a thousand, about, well, I guess 1,500 miles away, whatever, um, unless 
you have one thing, you could go to New York. And that night, this is in 1922, that night he packed up his belongings and he fled Connecticut and moved to New York. He left his kids behind, his business behind, eventually he brought them there. But that's what, that's what it was like. You know, he either could be taken away from everything he knew or flee to a, a new state. He eventually was taken to Cargill because his case got so bad. He actually became blind. It can affect the nerves around your eyes. Um, and he became blind. He became, his hands, you know, kind of became, get, uh, kind of a claw-like. Um, and he got so sick, so that that's when the doctors said he should really go. But that's how bizarre it was that you had, you know, in New York, you were fine. Connecticut, you were something terrible and you needed to be sent away for the rest of your life. I have a couple more questions for Ms. Fessler, but if you have a question for her, please put your hand up and we'll make sure and get a microphone to you. Um, while we're doing that, I do want to ask you, um, as you wrote in your acknowledgments, writing a book is something that you had always wanted to do, yeah. um, but we can imagine it's a challenging thing to undertake. So. Um, what was the hardest part of this process for you? And what are you most proud of in regard to um, Carvel's Cure? Um, what I'm most proud of is that since I've written this book, I have heard from other families, relatives, uh, descendants of patients who were at Carvel or people, and some of them didn't know the whole story and they now have a better understanding of what happened to their relatives. And I do think that it has um, helped a bit with um, you know, people's understanding of, of diseases and you know, how we should victimize the, the, the patient um, themselves. And was there another part of that question? The hardest part? What are you most proud of? And that was what, what I was the, most proud of. What is the hardest part of this? I don't know. I actually, it, I mean, it's a lot of work to write a book. But I, I did take a, a year off leave from my job at NPR. So it was after being a journalist for so many years where you have to, you know, you have dead, daily deadlines, you're constantly going from one story to another. It was actually a pleasure to be able to sink into one story and dig deep into it. And as I said, I had so much material. I, I thought it was great. I mean, I can't, was there a part? Poor, my husband had to live through the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> It was harder on him because he had to do all of, you know, like the cooking and everything and be my IT guy. <laughs> Questions from our audience. Do you think um, if they had access to our ability to spread information now, there's a lot of talk of violation of rights now. I can only imagine the talk it would be if they're actually taking people away, taking them to the facility. Do you think if they had the ability to spread information as fast as we can now, do you that it would further compound on the ignorance, or do you think that the actual information would have been spread and they would have been taken out of that facility faster? My guess is they would have been taken out of the facility faster because when the patients were able to use that newspaper and to generate this um, you know, interest outside of Carville to their plight, they, that, that's when the federal government really started to, to shift. And they cared so passionately about getting their freedom that I think they would have countered any of the disinformation. Uh, you know, not, not that there wasn't a lot. You know, as I say, that's sort of how it got started because there were all these stories drumming up the hysteria about you know how these people were spreading this dangerous disease. But uh, but I think I think ultimately the patients would have been able to use it effectively and it would have happened faster. I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, around this time, right after World War II, there were, there was this high profile, this couple, that the wife had leprosy and her husband was a, um, they, she had been in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, uh, a prisoner of war, what would you call it? Uh, internment camp, yeah, in the Philippines. So when she came home after the war, she was diagnosed with leprosy. Her husband was a war hero. He had been in the Bataan um, Death March. And he made a big stink about them wanting to send his wife to Carville. And he said, if she goes, I want to go. 
and it became a huge national story. And they were arguing that it was not that contagious. She ultimately did get sent to Carville. He moved down there. They wouldn't let him move into the facility, but he lived right outside. He went there every single day um, to be with his wife. But they became huge activists. And that's when they were, uh, the patients got their right to vote back because it was so ludicrous that these war heroes were not able to vote that the state of Louisiana, which had imposed the law in the first place, I guess maybe we should change it. Yeah, um, so yeah, this shocked me because I cover voting for NPR. I can't believe this. Why would they take their, away their right to vote? So the state of Louisiana had a long time law that if you were a, um, a, a inmate at a state-run facility, usually they had prison uh, prisons, um, also um, uh, what they called you know mental institutions at the time, um, and the leprosarium, and they called them inmates. They didn't call them patients. Um, they, even the federal government called them inmates at Carville. You were not allowed to vote. And they just threw them all into one. Uh, and, and now Carville has, the, 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 the patients became very active voters because they were such activists, right? So they, they had like 90% turnout. And they really started becoming a, a, a real um, lobbying group and a political force. We do have time for a few more questions. Um, so if you have a question, please place Put your hand up and we'll bring a microphone to you. Um, most of us in this room are either currently public health professionals or will be public health professionals. I'm curious, Ms. Bessler, as to what is the most important lesson that you would share with us from Carvel's Cure um, to guide our work in public health? Well, I mean, you guys probably all know, know this, but I mean, a lot of what I see from the Carville story is it was constantly a balance between what do you do to protect the public health? And then you have individual rights and what's, what the impact is on the individual and how you balance them. Now, in Carville, or the case with Hansen's disease, it was distorted because people thought they were protecting the public health by isolating these patients when in fact they weren't. Um, and so these patients having their rights denied is really terrible right, because they're being denied for no particular reason. So to me, it's that. It's like, a, how do you balance the two? And I think the other thing is to recognize that all of these decisions that you make not only have an impact on the community, but they have this impact on the individual, tremendous impact on the individual, but also their families, you know, their children, their grandchildren, I mean, I really saw that with writing this book, that it, it, it kind of had this ripple effect um, this, that this one decision made generations later still had an impact on, on, on these families. Um, so it was very, one thing I do want to kind of add real quickly is that, um, did I mention that little boy, uh, Oscar Dempster, who was there when he, he was admitted at seven, he died at Carville in 2010, and he was 91 years old, and he spent his entire life there. We have another question from the audience. You mentioned that you brought your father-in-law to Carville. What were some of the emotions that he felt when he was there? Um, again, now I'm gonna cry up because <laughs> um, it was amazing. I mean, he, I thought he was kind of a shy, quiet kid. So when we went there at first, you know, he was just really quiet, and there were still some patients there. There was a museum there. We actually saw some things that his father had written. They had some old ledgers. Um, but by far the most emotional thing, um, he's, the, the family's Jewish, and his father, there were many patients who were buried at Carville. There's a cemetery there today where many of the patients, but a lot of them were buried elsewhere. He was buried in a small Jewish cemetery near Baton Rouge. And so the public health nurse who was guiding us around had discovered where my father-in-law's father was buried and she drove us out there. And we went to this tiny little cemetery and we walked in 
and way, way in the corner, kind of abandoned him. I think it was because he had leprosy that even in the cemetery, they kind of pushed him away from all the other uh, gravestones. And we went there and, and to watch my father-in-law at age 78, to see where his father had finally ended up was just extraordinary. I mean, it was just, I, I, can't, I can't even explain it. And, and I think it was that moment that really made me want to write this book. Um, you know, for he had known for 63 years where his father had gone, and there he was. And I guess I can tell the other part of it. Should I go on to the So over the years as a reporter at NPR, I went down to New Orleans a lot, and Louisiana to cover stories. And every time I would go, if I could, I would go to that cemetery to, to visit. And I noticed it wasn't being cared for very well. It was all overgrown. And we talked to the person who ran the, the cemetery, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll clean it up. And then one time I went down there, and there was garbage all over it. and. Um, it looked like actually somebody was sleeping near there. It was all sleeping there. And I told Matt, and we said, well, we have got to do something about this. Well, Morris, the patient, was a, a veteran, a US veteran. He had contracted this, we think, in the um, uh, Philippines in 1902 as a soldier. So as, you know, in the, in the service of the country, he had contracted this disease. So Matt, went to see if he, we could move his remains to Arlington Cemetery. And through a very, 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 very long process, we were able to do that. And then in 2016, in December of 2016, we had, they had a, a burial for him and a service, a full memorial military service to bury him at Arlington Cemetery. Actually, he's in the columbarium. It was his, remain, his um, cremated remains. And it was extraordinary. I mean, the military, they treated it almost like it was somebody who had just died. So here was somebody who had fought in a war 114 years earlier, who had died 80 years earlier, and they were treating it like, you know, it had just happened, and they were honoring him. And they did it. They, they, they gave us the flag, and they said, this is for the service, you know. It, we're a grateful nation for the service of this man for his country. And so for us, this was just a, an extraordinary way to round out this story, right? So a man who contracted this disease in the service of his country, then take it from his family, as a result of that disease by that same government now being honored um, by, by, by the government and by, by the nation. Thank you for sharing that. And for those of you who have yet to read the book, if you can't uh, make the time to read it in its entirety, read the epilogue and read the account of that experience at Arlington. Um, because Ms. Fessler does an amazing job of putting you in that moment and you will feel the emotion um, that she has just shared uh, with us. So I um, so enjoyed reading your book um, because for me it's not a book about leprosy, it's a book about the enduring nature of the human spirit. And I'm grateful that you have chose to write this book. I'm grateful that you brought the stories of, of your family uh, to us and for sharing your afternoon with us. We are all grateful. So I'm going to ask you to please join me in giving Ms. Fessler a round of applause. <laughs>